Hello and welcome to the latest video in this series which asks the question, which money is best? Now usually I start by asking our guests why the particular form of money that they favour is the best one. But this time around, we're going to finish with that question because the particular form of money, or should I say system, is so bizarre sounding that you simply won't believe it and then we'll have to explain why it's so good after we've established that it's even possible. Now, George Selgin is the expert on what's called free banking and he joins me today. But before we say hello to him, I want to explain to you that back in 2008, when he went into a podcast called Econ Talk, he completely changed my worldview with what he's about to tell you today. So I hope he'll do the same for you. Good luck to you, George. Oh, thanks, Nick. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Do you want me to just launch into a discussion or do you want to start with any special questions? Uh, I think the best way to start is with a, a really simple explanation of what free banking is, and then we'll dig into uh, whether it's even possible. Okay. All right. So uh, today, of course, m most people are uh, used to uh, having currency, paper currency that comes from a single central bank, like the Bank of England, for example, or the Federal Reserve Banks here in the United States. Uh, there are exceptions, and, and some of your listeners will know that the Scottish, uh, uh, that several Scottish commercial banks still issue their own currency uh, under very strict regulations. And there are also exceptions in Ireland and uh, uh, Hong Kong. But uh, free banking refers to a system in which uh, the commercial banks are the only source of currency. And uh, historically, of course, that meant paper currency, no, no digital stuff yet. And, um, and they do so uh, in the absence of any central bank because uh, they, take direct they took the direct responsibility for redeeming their currency in gold or silver or whatever the commodity standard money was. And since you had such a commodity standard, underlying the system you didn't you didn't need a central bank to manage the quantity of that stuff uh the the uh the, there were market forces that were largely responsible for it anyway uh numerous countries actually uh had no central banks even up uh into the early 20th century and uh, some of them had very free banking systems in the sense that the commercial banks uh, that uh, supplied paper currency in them were regulated, of course. There were always some regulations, but they were not very heavy-handed regulations. And what makes this interesting is that contrary to what a lot of people might assume, uh, some of the systems, some of those systems that were least regulated, that were most free, including, by the way, the Scottish system, which in, uh, before 1845 was relatively unregulated, worked extremely well. They had remarkable records of stability, better records than systems like the English system before 1845 and after, that did have central banks, or at least uh, proto-central banks. So... Uh, Several other people, Lawrence White, Kevin Dowd, and I have uh, made a point of studying these systems in order to understand why they work so well. So it wasn't as if we uh, we tried to uh, make the case that free banking system a free banking system could work well. We knew that they had worked well, and we had to figure out how that was possible. And, uh, and we did. Uh, uh, it turns out that there are self-ordering mechanisms at work in these systems uh, based on competition itself that worked to discipline every individual bank and uh, uh, keep the system as a whole, as a result, uh, conducive to a remarkable degree of financial stability. So there you go. I should mention that these were also very efficient systems. They were very good at channeling scarce savings into productive investment. So they also did a good job contributing to long-run economic development. So financial stability, good. <laughs> long-run economic development, good. And uh, that's, that makes them worth taking seriously for whatever lessons we could draw from them today.
given what's in the news at the moment, I think it's worth mentioning the inflation statistics as well. So if you could just give us a one line, was there 10% inflation under uh, the Scottish uh, free banking system? And no, no, of course not. Uh, though that uh, the inflation rates in these systems ultimately depended on, on their being uh, bound up by uh, the gold standard or silver standard. So the scarcity of the underlying standard uh, uh, medium uh, metallic medium kept the lid on upward price movements but sometimes would allow uh, some relatively mild upward price movements and and sometimes would allow e typically even more mild downward price movements uh, but uh, but they achieved long run price level stability meaning that uh, uh, the records show the tendon, the long run tendency was for the price level in a hundred years to be what it was, <laughs> to be the same, uh, and that that too is a, a result of of market forces. It wasn't a coincidence. It has to do with the profitability of gold mining and how that relates to the price of other stuff relative to the price of gold. And uh, the tendency was for more gold to be mined if prices tended to rise generally and less if they tended to fall. And in the long run, you ended up even Stephen. So the underlying idea here is that if you don't have the government determining the monetary system and controlling the monetary system and making laws that are unique for the banking system, which don't apply to any other part of the economy, then what you have is a free banking system. In that system, right. banks issue their own money, which is mm -hmm. money that is backed by gold. You can go and redeem the gold or the silver or whatever it is that's backing that system. Mm -hmm. But surely, George, banking is just too important to be left to the private sector. Right. Yes. So uh, <laughs> here's a very important point for uh, your listeners. Uh, we do tend to think of regulation of banks and money as contributing to the stability of financial systems and, and to their overall uh, smooth operation. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's a big mistake because historically governments regulated banks uh, for all kinds of reasons and, uh, and, and not simply with an eye towards stability. They regulated to cater to special interests. They regulated to cater to their own uh, fiscal interests very often. And the war. result, uh, uh, yes, and to finance war, for example. The result, uh, the consequence of this is that quite often, and I would say more often than not, special regulations in banking in the past, and to some extent today as well, were destabilizing. They, they, they contributed to instability. Let me give you an example, but, and, and this example is a useful one because it shows how even the, the very existence or creation of a privileged bank of issue, a bank of issue is a bank that issues currency, paper currency, even the existence of such a bank often uh, went hand in hand with regulations that weakened other banks. In England, for example, the note issue privileges were accumulated in the Bank of England. It started out with some special privileges, and those privileges tended to grow over time into a full-fledged monopoly of currency in England. Well, <clears throat> the counterpart of this, these, this, the increased power given to the Bank of England was the deprivation of all other English banks of, of, of their strength. For example, until uh, 1830 or 1826, depending on which step away from this restriction you consider most important, no other bank of England, uh, no other bank of issue in England could have more than six partners. They were they were literally constrained to be small, and by being constrained to be small, because partnerships just couldn't raise that much capital. By being constrained to be small, they were constrained to be under diversified, to not have many uh, ability to branch. They were very, very weak and vulnerable. So you created this privileged monopoly uh, uh, at the uh, in a sea of extremely weak banks, made, made weak by regulatory restrictions. And then, lo and behold, of course, the weak banks would fail quite often. 
and uh, the central bank or the privileged bank, the Bank of England, would, would, would be strong compared to them. No kidding. But uh, the, 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 the impression this, has given, this gave people that, oh, we need a central bank to come to the rescue of all of these other ordinary banks, it was quite misleading because the truth was rather that the, 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 the privileged status of the central bank of the Bank of England uh, came at the cost of the artificial weakening of other English banks. If we turn to the Scottish system instead, right, at the same time, there were no such there was no such concentration of privileges in any one bank instead you had several dozen banks of issue competing at least legally on equal footing of course some were bigger than others and all that and and they they, they didn't all operate under quite the same uh, regulatory statutes but there was relative equality and the result of that was that none of these banks were as weak as the english country banks but none was able to cause as much trouble through abuse of privileges as the Bank of England was. So you ended up with a much more stable system where every bank was in a position to discipline all the other banks. Uh, and this, this even Stephen, uh, if you like, competition among uh, uh, various banks, none of which was uh, a hegemon that <laughs> dominated, uh, produced much more stability than England. And and so, this is the bottom line, England had many, many financial crises in the late uh, 18th and early 19th century and, and, and later as well. And while these crises were uh, <laughs> affecting the English economy, in Scotland, separated just by a, a river <laughs> and different laws, but not much else, uh, everything would be calm. They didn't have the crises. That's, that's what people should be aware of. You know, you want to know which system worked, the Scottish system did, and notoriously, I mean famously, everyone knew this at the time. Today, people have forgotten. They need to be reminded. The irony there is that the justification of the Bank of England being there is the failure of those uh, those banks, and yet they failed because the Bank of England was granted this monopoly. So it's, it's a that's good example exactly of how right. things get That's twisted. exactly right. We they, they, The English laws that gave the Bank of England the abilities to serve as a lender of last resort, an ability it did not uh, wish to acknowledge until toward the last part of the 19th century. But those laws also uh, made it much more likely that other English banks would uh, fail in the event of any sorts of uh, any major shocks. And so uh, uh, it ultimately, uh, the duty of the Bank of England to try to rescue other banks uh, became generally acknowledged. Now, I should say that after, after 1830, certainly, uh, other English banks beside the Bank of England were allowed to become joint stock companies, so they weren't any more limited, they weren't limited any longer to being partnerships. However, uh, outside of uh, a, a large area surrounding London, they were denied the privilege of issuing currency. That was the deal. So they couldn't issue paper currency anymore, but they could be joint stock companies. Well, the inability to issue their own paper currency was still itself uh, a weakening, a, deb a deb debilitating legal restriction uh, that continued to make them reliant on the Bank of England as the only source of that stuff. So if their customers needed paper, uh, they couldn't produce their own, unlike the Scottish banks. And so you still got the result that it looked like you needed the Bank of England to service these other banks, that they wouldn't be viable on their own. Well, of course, they weren't viable on their own because they weren't allowed to do st certain things on their own. Let's focus on how the Scottish system actually works, because when I heard about this in 2008, um, my mum, I think, lived in Scotland at the time, and I grabbed a bunch of Scottish bank notes, the Clydesdale Bank, Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, and Bank of England. I kept... Uh, those notes in my wallet, waiting desperately to show someone uh, to tell them about free banking and to have the proof in my in my wallet that it was real and it really happened. Um, mm. So that's how excited I got about it. So tell us how this system of, of Scottish free banking is an example. There's other other, other systems, but that's a particularly easy one to understand. How yes. did it work? 
So the key to a free banking system is that because every bank has equal privileges, no bank will hold on to another bank's notes and treat them as reserves. Uh, instead, the banks were all jealously guarding their own share of the market for currency. They're all trying to get as big a part of that market as possible. Uh, so when they get their hands on a rival bank's currency notes, they send them back for payment. And in other words, they treat them the way banks today treat uh, checks. I won't be able to say that much longer because nobody will know what a check is. But I think your audience mostly still does. So uh, ultimately what happened was all the banks, uh, uh, at first they tried not even accepting their rivals' notes. But that turned out not to be a good strategy because that meant that their rivals could accumulate their notes and stage a run. So what ended up explain emerging... That, Ex explain the idea of, of staging a run, because that accountability mechanism is one of the keys. Yeah, so there were these things called note raids, and what, what would happen, it would especially be a, uh, something done for a, an upstart bank. A new bank would get in the system, and the other banks, this was in the 17th century, and relatively, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, eight, early 18th century didn't happen after that, uh, the other banks would say, "Okay, we're not going. We're going to refuse this to accept these upstart notes on deposit. We're not going to deal with them in the ordinary course of business, but we might acquire. A, a, we might uh, uh, buy them up in the marketplace uh, and accumulate a war chest of them. And then, when we've got plenty, we'll stage a run on the bank and make it." Uh, confronted with all these notes it has to pay at once in the hopes of putting it out of business. So these were called note raids. Nasty, nasty. Pay out. Competition is nasty. Pay out. Pay out uh, gold. They'd have to pay out gold. Uh, they'd have to have the gold. Because these, remember, all these bank notes or silver, in those days it probably would have been silver, all these bank notes are IOUs. They're claims to gold or silver. Just as your bank deposits today are IOUs to central bank money. So the banks were certainly, they were bound to pay. And in Scotland, you had something called summary di diligence, which without going into the legal details, basically meant if a bank dishonored its notes, even one pound, that was it. It was, it was finito, it was closed. So they were very strict about that. And that was important. So anyway, banks tried this business of raiding their rivals to put them out of business. But of course, uh, this was not an efficient uh, equilibrium. And what ultimately happened was that banks realized that it was in their own interest to cooperate. Not cooperate in the sense of not competing, but cooperate by uh, accepting other banks' notes in the ordinary course of exchange, uh, as long as the, they had no reason to consider them to be insolvent or in danger of failing. And, uh, and then they would send them routinely back for payment. And... Uh, uh, though at first, uh, in some cases, uh, they might do this bilaterally. Ultimately, clearing houses were established, central agencies in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and there would be basically a bunch of agents there, tellers, and all the banks would send the notes they'd collected from other banks to the clearing house uh, daily, eventually. And the clerks would figure out which banks owed the most to which other banks, and they would arrange for the settlements to happen in gold. Anyway, this was a, the clearinghouse mechanism, uh, the clearing mechanism, uh, was a very important source of discipline, was the crucial source of discipline, because in that mechanism, if any bank tried to be over generous in its lending, which would mean putting out more notes, relatively speaking, than its rivals were, it, the requests for settlement me, settlement would mount against it at the clearing house would have what we call adverse clearings that would get very large and if it <laughs> didn't curtail its lending uh it would run out of gold and that would mean it it would fail there was a famous instance of this that some of your audience has probably heard of the air bank failure in the early 1860s uh, 1760s and the Air Bank was an upstart bank, and its directors said, you know, we don't want to be small for very long. Let's be a big bank, and let's do it right away. 
So they lent very generously. And before long, they actually did become, briefly, <laughs> one of the biggest Scottish banks. The only problem was that the clearing system took its toll. And they found themselves hammering reserves, you know, the owing reserves to other banks. They tried to deal with this by actually borrowing uh, in the London market, borrowing specie, gold or silver. Uh, well, but how long can you do that? Ultimately, the whole thing went up in flames. Brought down a couple other Scottish banks, but the wiser ones kept their distance because they knew what was coming. Uh, I think it was a very nice thing in a way because it uh, it brought a lot more discipline. It, it it showed that the Scottish system did what it's supposed to do. You put an irresponsibly managed bank out of business, and uh, for a hun for a century afterwards, there were no crises in Scotland. So I call that a salutary lesson. <laughs> uh, uh, but it does illustrate that the discipline of the clearing system was was real. It was not something that economists just like myself imagine might have worked. And Adam Smith, I believe, was a director or just a shareholder in, in the Air Bank? He was a shareholder, yes. He was yeah. among many people who got burned by the Air Bank failure. Uh, but uh, to his credit, although uh, Smith did Partly as a result of that episode, he did favor two regulations in banking. And by the way, uh, there's very good work by a fellow named Tyler Goodspeed about the air bank failure that talks about all of this. Uh, Smith concluded that it would be best to not let banks issue, after that episode, that Scottish banks, that banks generally, shouldn't be able to issue very small denomination notes. Uh, and he also favored uh, not allowing them to have so-called uh, uh, optional clauses on their notes, which would be clauses saying that they could suspend payments in an emergency or uh, 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 at the uh, decision by the directors. And for six months, you'd get some interest on the note, but you wouldn't be able to cash it for gold. Well, Tyler has shown that uh, both of these restrictions were actually adopted by the Scottish Parliament in 1775. Uh, Tyler has shown that actually neither of them was warranted. Neither of the things that were prohibited uh, had any role in the air bank crisis. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh, they didn't matter. The, the new regulations wouldn't have prevented the same crisis from happening. It could even have made it worse. So bottom line, uh, though, is that despite getting burned in the air disaster, Adam Smith favored free banking with two minor regulatory interventions, apart from ordinary enforcement of contracts, of course. None of us, I should say, free bankers don't say that there should be no laws for banking. There should be contract, there should be enforcement of you know the usual business contracts. Anyway, Smith uh, was a free banker. He was very keen on the system. Uh, and he, if, if, if there was anything bad about Smith besides his countenancing these two laws that probably weren't desirable, it's that he took, he took the Scottish system for granted. And his whole discussion of banking and the wealth of nations about how much it contributes to economic development and et cetera, et cetera, how uniform, it's all based on the Scottish system. But he doesn't say that. He, 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 he doesn't say, by the way, I'm talking about how things work in Scotland. He makes it sound like it's general. And of course, unfortunately, it wasn't. In England, you had a banking system that didn't have the virtues of the, the one that Smith uh, writes so eloquently about. All of this probably sound like total chaos to, to the listeners, the idea that every bank can issue as much money as it wants. And yes. then there's, there's lots of different currencies flying right. around all over the place. Was it did, did it work? Was it trusted? So uh, it did work. It worked quite well. Let, let, let's be clear. Uh, it's important here. This is a good opportunity to distinguish what happened in Scotland and in some other countries with what happened in the United States. So first of all, these Scottish banknotes were uniform. Uh, because they were actively settled and redeemed, they maintained their nominal face values in terms of the underlying standard, whether it was silver or gold. 
So a one pound note from the Clydesdale Bank and a one pound note from the Royal Bank of Scotland were both worth one pound. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that was true of all Scottish banknotes all the time. Of course, if a Scottish bank failed, then its notes would not command their full value. But it was a, an on or off thing. It was a black and white thing. Either a bank was sound and its notes commanded their par value and uh, 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 or a bank had failed and they were they might be worth something in liquidation but they were not going to circulate they were going to be you know, uh, sold to brokers or whatever so if you traveled around scotland then just as is true today it, you didn't concern yourself with which brands of scottish banknotes you had in your wallet you didn't mind the fact that they had different designs they didn't look the same uh, you just had to know that the banks were sound, and and uh, and that was not so hard. You took your own bank's soundness for granted, or you wouldn't have chosen it, and you accepted any notes that that bank accepted, which would be all the banks and the notes of all the banks that were in good standing at the clearinghouse, and so it was simple. Now, this was with about you know depending on the year. 20, 30, 40 banks. We turned to the United States <laughs> in the first half of the, before the Civil War. And we have a, a completely different situation that has really given a black eye to, uh, to competitive note issue. But only because people aren't cognizant of the role regulations played in, uh, I want to use a, an impolite word, I'll just say screwing up the uh, antebellum uh, U.S. currency system. So, what did we have? First of all, uh, we had thousands of independent banks of issue. Thousands. Uh, even, this is even before the Civil War. Uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, that meant that great a variety of brands of banknotes. So, that's the first fact, which is obviously difficult to deal with in itself. Second, these notes did not always circulate at their face value, unlike the notes of the Scottish system. Instead, uh, they they were tended to be discounted, uh, that is, to circulate often at values below their par value. But why were these things true? Well, there's a simple explanation for both. U.S. laws did not allow banks to branch, with very limited exceptions. They couldn't even have branches in this in a single town, or let alone <coughs> throughout a state, and certainly not beyond state lines. So what did this mean? It meant that if uh, if you had a a note from say oh a bank in Connecticut, but you were in Michigan, the no one would take that note at its full value, because they at least had to deduct the cost involved of sending the note, getting the note all the way back to Connecticut, getting it redeemed, and then getting the specie back <laughs> home safely at a time when that meant stagecoaches and maybe the occasional, you know, uh, uh, paddle steamer. So uh, if you look at the history of those banknote discounts, you find confirmation very easily that they were based on these redemption costs, not not really the underlying soundness of the banks. So there were also a lot of unsound banks. That's another issue where regulations played another part. So uh, the proof is, first of all, uh, the discounts applied to notes tended to be fairly uniform if they were all from the same area. So in Chicago, Notes of all Connecticut banks might be subject to a 1% discount, for example. That, that suggests this was a, a distance or transaction cost thing, not a bank solvency thing. The costs clearly declined over time, just as you'd expect because of improvements in transportation, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's other evidence as well. So when we think about the non-uniformity of the uh, antebellum currency and why it was different than Scotland, uh, the first thing that has to be recognized is the role of the government restrictions on branch banking. Uh, 
with branches, I should make clear, if you have branches, then as long as there's a nearby branch of the bank that issued the note, if the bank in Connecticut has a branch in Chicago, that note will pass at par in Chicago if it passes at par in Connecticut, which it did. And, uh, and so branch, the lack of branch banking uh, was the real culprit. And that's not a market failure. That's a government failure. That's a government interference with what banks would tend to do. Because banks always, in every country where they've been allowed to branch, the tendency has been for banks to have branches precisely so they can make for a wider market for their deposits and notes, if they were issued notes in the past. And uh, so it's in their interest to branch. It's not in their interest to be so-called unit banks, which we had so many of. And then you'd have many fewer banks with branching. So you wouldn't be dealing with, you know, a thousand brands of banknotes. You might have at most a couple hundred banks of issue, which sounds big, but if you have knowledge of which notes are in good standing with your bank, uh, <clears throat> you needn't worry about dealing with those. Here, anyway, you, so that's it. Yeah. A key issue that you haven't mentioned that I recall is that a bank that's not allowed to diversify across a, a, a country or even internationally only has lending in that general area. So if you're a, a, right. a bank in a place that grows lots of corn, then most of your, your borrowers are going to be corn farmers. If the corn price falls, then the whole bank's in trouble. Whereas a that's diversified right. That's right. I've, that's right. I've only emphasized here how the lack of branch banking contributed to the note discounts because of the transaction transacting costs. But the same inability to branch made banks much more vulnerable to insolvency because they couldn't diversify their uh, assets or their liabilities in in a day when you couldn't sell loans and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, it, it was pretty much the case that a bank uh, without branches was uh, bound to have a heavy concentration of loans in its portfolio that were in local enterprises. And in a small enough area, there might not be that many different kinds of local enterprises. It might all just be a bunch of you know wheat farms or something. So how diverse can you be? Yeah, so th this... This meant that there were also a lot more failures of U.S. banks. The lack of branch banking played a, a very similar role in the United States and played it longer as the restriction of banks to six partners, the so-called six-partner yeah, yeah. rule, uh, played in yeah. England. The underlying idea is that as good as free banking may be, the government still found ways to, to make a mess of it. Well, then, I wouldn't put it that way, Nick. I would say that the U.S. system that is unfortunately called free banking, those some of the U.S. state systems were named free banking systems in the laws that created them. They weren't truly free banking systems at all. The, the extent of the regulations was far beyond what the, those of us who write about real free banking would consider acceptable. I, sh I mentioned the lack of branching, but uh, the other thing that was true of all U.S. so-called free banking systems, these were all established before the Civil War in, in about, uh, I don't know, a dozen or more states, their banks could not freely issue paper notes on the basis of their general assets. They all were required to buy certain specified securities as backing for their notes. And here's the catch. <laughs> in many cases, or in too many cases, the securities that they were legally required to buy as note backing turned out to be junk. What the state governments would do is put their own bonds uh, uh, on the list of securities that were eligible for backing notes, even if their finances were in, not in good sound shape, because they wanted to have a market for their bonds. And so if the European Central Bank academics are listening. This yeah, is a, a key point. Yeah. So so the banks found themselves saddled with securities that turned out to lose value. And uh, careful e economic historians have actually shown that that was the main cause of free bank failures in the antebellum United States. So well, <laughs> share well, share well, well, the regulation, right? Uh, yeah. well, everybody should, in studying economic history, uh, 
before you conclude that an inst a private institution failed because it 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 it's, uh, was badly managed, or because of some inherent market failures, ask whether there was some regulation that actually was part of what happened. And nine times out of ten, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And also ask whether that same regulation is currently playing an important role in your own financial system. Uh, yeah. But let's not go there. Let's touch briefly on the idea of fractional reserve banking, because that's part mm -hmm. of a, a debate, yes. uh, especially in your academic community. I, I'll try and explain what fractional reserve banking is, because I don't want to get dug in too much. And then you can explain how that played out in the free banking world. So fractional reserve banking is the idea that uh, a bank only has a small amount of reserves on hand whether it's gold or cash or whatever it might be, in order to meet depositors' demands. So if all the depositors show up at the bank on the same day to say they want their gold or their banknotes out, the bank would not be able to meet those demands because it's lent out a lot of those deposits. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how banking works as a business. Now, some people would say that is fraud. It's legalized fraud, and the government has to legalize it by making a law that says banks can do fractional reserve. Mm -hmm. A storage unit that you know, stores your summer furniture over winter cannot go and lend out your summer furniture. But a bank can go and lend out your deposit, which begs the question why it's called a deposit. Mm -hmm. That's as far as I want to get into the fractional reserve banking world, uh, the, the theoretical idea. Mm. How did fractional reserve banking work in the Scottish system? Because it, it, it sounds like fractional reserve banking needs a government to make it viable because of this issue of whether it's fraud or not. Right, right. Well, first of all, there's absolutely nothing to the fraud claim. It's absol there's absolutely no basis for it, historically, and certainly not uh, in modern times. It has never been the case that uh, that uh, the banks that practiced fractional reserve banking, which they practically all have done. A, ba a bank that doesn't have fractional reserves isn't really a bank, it's just a warehouse. And there are a lot of things that banks do that a, a, a warehouse bank couldn't do. Circulating notes, for example. A warehouse can't have circulating bearer notes because how does it collect the warehouse fees? How does it know <laughs> who's storing the money? so they can send a bill to them. Uh, of course, the first person who stores the money and then gets an, a, a, a bank, a note for it, and then passes the note on could end up paying the storage fees forever, but that's not gonna work. <laughs> so you can't, you can't have circulating banknote currency with warehouse banking. It's a problem, at least you couldn't historically. Okay, um, so fraud, uh, that's just phony. That's just phony. It's bad legal theory, it's bad history. The Scottish system, of course, all the banks were fractional reserves. And, and by the way, the reserve ratios were, you know, specie reserve ratios were remarkably low. You'd be terrified today, based on what people, you know, conventional wisdom says, to know that the, the average Scottish bank as early as, say, 1830 was holding maybe 1% specie reserves. You know, something like that. To clarify what that means. So that meant that for every hundred pounds of banknotes outstanding, and let's throw in the demand deposits, uh, which were not very important, but still part of the demand liabilities, they'd have perhaps a dollar of silver or gold on hand. That's it. It's a very small amount. They would have a large amount of secondary reserves, what we today call secondary reserves, usually con consisting of highly uh, um, uh, uh, liquid and relatively safe exchequer securities. From you know, this be the, the 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 counterpart of uh, of uh, exchequer securities today uh, as a secondary reserve, but the actual but the actual specie reserves would be quite small, but but. They're, they were small. They weren't small arbitrarily. They were small because the Scottish banks discovered that that's all they needed because the confidence in Scottish bank notes was so high that people hardly ever came to request specie. That hardly ever happened. And, and for the clearing and settlements I was talking about before, most of the time the banks were willing to settle they often settled with the exchequer bills with the secondary securities and they would use gold for small amounts and that sort of thing. Um, that didn't mean that nobody could have their gold or silver. Uh, I keep seeing, saying gold because we're used to thinking of gold. 
but primarily in the early part of the 19th century, silver would have been the de facto standard money. Um, if somebody needed gold for ex or silver for export purposes, whatever, the, the Scottish banks didn't hesitate to hand it out. And they would hand out gold or silver for other purposes, for any reason, if people requested it. But for the most part, they simply didn't request it. There's an exception, and it's not unimportant. I'll get to it. Um, there was a famous quote in an early work on Scottish banking to, to the effect that uh, the first thing a, Scot, uh, a Scotsman did with a gold guinea was to get rid of it, rush to a Scottish bank and get a good Scottish banknote and some change uh, because the, the guinea was less convenient. The, you know, the, guinea, the coins would wear holes in people's pockets, and etc. Banknotes were the preferred currency, and they were also less likely to be uh, fake because there was, there was, the coins were not always reliable, we have to remember. They were count, they were counterfeiting problems. So that was the reality. The, the low reserve ratio grew out of experience. It wasn't something the banks adopted because they were reckless. They adopted it because uh, they had found that that's all they needed to operate prudently. Now, the exception I was mentioning is that in 1797, a, uh, during the Napoleonic, uh, the French Wars, the, uh, there was a, a, a big run on the Bank of England, and the Bank of England suspended payments, specie payments. And when that happened, it was a big problem for the Scottish banks, because, you know, they, <laughs> they weren't going to get paid what they were owed uh, from English banks now. And they had to make a very difficult decision. They held public meetings. The, to make a long story short, uh, the Scottish banks decided that they would stick to the British pound, now a paper standard, and suspend gold payments themselves. They still paid out gold for special cases. They tried to make it possible for people who really needed gold for ex importing goods and that sort of thing to have the gold. But generally speaking, they restricted in sympathy with the English banks, and the English banks remained on uh, paper standard until uh, 1821, so so did the Scottish banks. Some people have viewed this as a, a black mark against the Scottish banks, but I've written about this, so I won't go into any detail, but <clears throat> in fact, it was the wisest thing they could do under the circumstances for everybody's sake, their own customers' sake, and uh, and uh, and I think it actually showed the system to be very, very resilient in the face of uh, a uh, an event uh, uh, that uh, uh, that was beyond the bankers, quite beyond the bankers own control, certainly not their fault. I'm going to sum this up by saying that, that the idea is that money and banking shouldn't be different to, to all of the other parts of the economy, which the government does not say there is only one product here and you have to accept this one product. You know, there's not only one version of government toothpaste, one version of, car, of cars, except in, in communism and, and let's not go there. Um, the money and banking is, is the same and that uh, a free market where people can choose who they want to have uh, uh, their custom with, which banknotes they want to use, who they want to bank with, uh, actually delivers a really good and, and viable system. Let's move to, to the final question, which is just persuade me with, with sort of all the, the key points, why a free banking system offers the best form of money. So um, I would rephrase it. I would, I would say that for any standard money that you've got, you know, if you have gold or if you've got silver, or even if you have fiat as your basic money, a free banking system will make the best of it. Will give you uh, efficient banking. Will give you relatively stable banking. Uh, what it won't do is make up for the inherent shortcomings of the standard money itself. So you know, if if uh, if if gold if gold is unstable, if you have a big gold discovery, and that's going to make prices rise, uh, they'll rise in a free banking system too. Uh, it's not going to mean that bank runs never happen, uh, though free banking systems have more resilience for dealing with them, especially if they can suspend payments contractually, which which I think would be part of how they'd operate. Uh, but it does mean that 
uh, you have a generally much more efficient system, more conducive to economic development in the same ways that Adam Smith eloquently describes in The Wealth of Nations, and also more capable of avoiding uh, crises because the banks have more ability to fend for themselves. Whereas under central banking, they're denied the right to supply their customers with paper currency. They're often denied the right to suspend payments in the emergency. They're sometimes saddled with other regulations that do more harm than good. So for all these reasons, regulated banking systems can perform a lot worse than uh, truly free systems, other things equal. Again, the, it's not a question of, uh, the, it's not a question of the lack of regulations having been historically the most important cause of financial instability. It's been bad regulations and uh, limited regulations are better than bad regulations. Um, so uh, you, you can't rely on free banking to make up for the inherent shortcomings of a standard money. You could have, for example, a free banking system built on Bitcoin, perfectly feasible. And, uh, you know, the banks would would hold fractional reserves of Bitcoin. They would issue substitutes. Some of those substitutes would bear interest because uh, it earned on the whatever interest earning assets the, the banks acquired. Uh, and um, uh, that's that system would have its virtues. But it wouldn't make Bitcoin itself an optimal reserve medium, or optimal standard money, uh, whatever the shortcomings of Bitcoin as a standard might be, they would still be shortcomings free under a free banking system. So it's important to see the advantages of free banking without seeing it as a panacea that can make up for uh, the problems of the underlying monetary standard. And this is very important. No matter how free banks are, they don't decide what the standard money is. That's not their role. They take that for granted and they, they deal in it. Um, the choice of standard money happens outside the banking system and sometimes bad choices are made, uh, often by governments imposing their own fiat, badly managed fiat standards on society. And if the government doesn't impose that, I suppose whatever works best would emerge. Well, that's right. Presumably, in the absence of government intervention, we'd still be relying on commodity monies of some sort. And here it should be emphasized that I'm not, a, I'm not myself a proponent of trying to restore commodity standards for various reasons. But uh, the truth is that there's never been a standard uh, money uh, that worked better than the uh, classical gold standard did uh, between 1870 and World War I. And a lot of the perceived shortcomings of that arrangement were actually not shortcomings of a gold standard per se, but they were <laughs> problems with banking systems that uh, existed in different countries that performed badly. So for example, uh, the United States and England both had a lot of crises under the uh, gold standard. And now I am talking about after 1870. But other countries like Scotland and Canada, Canada was another great relatively free banking system, didn't experience those crises. So a lot of people will blame the crises on the gold standard without noticing that that explanation doesn't hold water because if it were the gold standard, then all the gold standard countries should have experienced similar financial instability. In fact, the ones with relatively free banking systems did not have that many uh, uh, crises. So let's, uh, let's point people uh, to where they should go if they either think you're a genius or you're a total wacko, but they want to know more. Where can they find out more about you, about free banking, and uh, and start their journey as I did back in 2008? Well, <clears throat> if they think I'm a genius, they, they, they should just go on Twitter and tell everybody that. Uh, but uh, as far as where, where they should go to learn more about this stuff, I myself uh, write uh, uh, regularly for uh, Cato's uh, online uh, monetary uh, policy publication, which is called Alt-M. Alt-M stands for Alternative Money. 
so they can find stuff there. I have a bunch of books they can uh, look at. Uh, there are also a bunch of books by uh, Lawrence White, my longtime, uh, my mentor first, a longtime colleague at University of Georgia, and now another another contributor to Altem. Kevin Dowd is the third author I'd mentioned, who's written quite a lot on on free banking. So all three uh, 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 of us can uh, be sources of information on that. Um, uh, apart from that, you mentioned the the uh, uh, podcast that I did in Econ Talk, and there is a lot now. There are a lot of podcasts uh, by the three of us and by others on free banking out there that uh, your listeners might uh, look up. So I think uh, those sources are probably the most important. I'll mention one other book that is uh, 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 considered crucial by all of us who are writing on free banking. It's a book written in 1936 by one of Friedrich Hayek's students, Vera Smith, and it's called The Rationale of Central Banking, and you can get copies of it cheap. I think it's also available online. And uh, Smith uh, uh, looks at the debates and the circumstances leading to the establishment of central banks in numerous European countries and in also, I believe, the United States. And uh, it's a fascinating book because it shows that there was a time when economists were sharply divided about whether central banking was a good idea or whether free banking was better. And uh, personally, I think the better arguments were on the sides of the free bankers in these debates. And I think uh, Vera Smith's uh, book bears that out. And, but governments had their thumbs heavily on the scale <laughs> because uh, if nothing else, they recognize the fiscal advantages that monopolies would, would give them. And I think that's what swayed the balance ultimately in favor of central banking. It wasn't the fact that the arguments for stability, etc., were strong uh, of the central bank proponents were the strongest. I think we might find out the hard way soon that um, free banking was the better option. George, <laughs> thanks very much for joining us and everyone at home. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Nick. It's been a pleasure.